Hello, I'm James Moak from the University of Virginia, and I'll be discussing hip sonography in the emergency department setting. In particular, we will discuss the indications for hip sonography, the anatomy of the hip, sonographic findings that correlate with that anatomy, and how to perform ultrasound-guided hip arthrocentesis. Finally, we will briefly touch on other applications for hip sonography that may be useful in the ED setting in the future. Please note that this lecture will focus primarily upon the pediatric hip because it is children who are at greatest risk for the disease we are most concerned about, septic arthritis. What are the indications for hip sonography? This is easy. There are really only two. Identify a hip effusion in the setting of possible septic arthritis and provide real-time guidance for hip arthrocentesis. Septic arthritis is a true orthopedic emergency that requires urgent arthrotomy and IV antibiotics. We'll spend most of our time in this lecture focusing on the use of ultrasound in the evaluation of septic arthritis. Other possible indications, such as for hip fracture, will be briefly discussed at the end. For the purposes of performing hip sonography, the anatomy we need to master can be easily remembered by repeating this mantra, head with growth plate, neck iliopsoas, anterior synovial space. Let's try that again. Repeat after me. Head with growth plate, neck iliopsoas, anterior synovial space. The femoral head rests in the acetabulum. The growth plate, which we will see when we scan pediatric patients, lies between the epiphysis and the metaphysis. The femoral neck lies in an oblique plane to the axial skeleton and to the femoral shaft. The iliopsoas muscle overlies the anterior surface of the femoral neck as it extends to its insertion site on the lesser trochanter. The anterior synovial space is that space between the cortex of the anterior femoral neck and the overlying iliopsoas muscle. So if you can remember these three structures, head with growth plate, neck iliopsoas, anterior synovial space, you've learned 90% of what you need to know to perform hip sonography. Additionally, you'll need to remember that the femoral vessels are located just medial to the hip joint and may at times be visible when scanning the joint. The femoral nerve, not shown here, lies lateral to the femoral artery. Now on to sonography. We will position the patient with the lower extremity in the neutral position and in most cases we'll be using a high frequency linear array transducer. In some large-sized adults, we may want to try a low-frequency phased array probe. The transducer will be oriented in plane with the femoral neck such that the probe indicator or bump points towards the umbilicus. Sonographically, we will see the femoral head with growth plate, the hyperechoic femoral neck, and more superficially, the iliopsoas muscle. The anterior synovial space lies between the femoral neck and the iliopsoas. This space is bounded by the anterior and posterior layers of the joint capsule. The anterior layer of the joint capsule lies just posterior to the iliopsoas muscle. The posterior layer lies just anterior to the anterior aspect of the femoral neck. This capsule is usually easier to appreciate when an effusion is present. Note that because we will point the probe indicator towards the umbilicus, regardless of whether we are scanning the left or right side, 
The femoral head will be displayed on the left side of the screen and the anterior synovial space on the right side. This is the case as long as the screen indicator, in this case an aqua colored dot, is on the left side of the screen. In this clip, we see a normal adult hip. Note the absence of the growth plate. This image shows an abnormal hip in a seven-year-old child. Let's review the labeled structures starting with the word effusion at the left-hand side of the image and proceeding clockwise. A very obvious hypoechoic effusion is present. At top left, the iliopsoas muscle is labeled. Just beneath the iliopsoas muscle, the anterior layer of the joint capsule is seen. This structure is actually easier to identify in the presence of an effusion. At the bottom right, the anterior synovial space is labeled. And finally at the bottom left, the hyperechoic femoral neck is labeled. The femoral head and growth plate are not seen in this image as they are out of view at screen left. Approximately 10% of asymptomatic children will have an effusion in the anterior synovial space. The question then becomes, how large must an effusion be to be considered abnormal? A 2001 review article by Valley and colleagues summarized prior literature on the upper limit of normal for hip effusions. In children, an effusion is abnormal if it measures greater than five millimeters from the cortex of the femoral neck to the anterior layer of the joint capsule, or if the effusion is more than two millimeters larger in size than the contralateral side. In adults, an effusion is considered abnormal if it measures more than five millimeters in width and extends along the entire length of the femoral neck. Tin and colleagues defined the size of normal and abnormal effusions in children more precisely. They developed formulas for the normal width of the anterior synovial space based on a patient's height, as shown in this formula, or a patient's age. Their study involved patients two to six years of age, so their formulas may not apply outside that age range. Though these formulas are quite precise, it's probably easier just to remember that an effusion is abnormal if greater than five millimeters in width or if more than two millimeters wider than the contralateral side. Arthrocentesis is performed first by sterilely prepping and draping the area overlying the femoral neck, applying a local anesthetic, and then directing the needle in plane with the transducer towards the anterior synovial space with real-time needle visualization. This technique is similar to that used when performing vascular access using a longitudinal approach. Although not shown in this photo, a sterile probe cover should be used. Depending upon the age of the child, sedation may be necessary. The operator should remove as much fluid as possible as this procedure is both diagnostic and therapeutic. This clip demonstrates ultrasound-guided arthrocentesis. At left, just off the screen, is the femoral head and growth plate. The femoral vessels can be seen in the upper left-hand corner of the screen. The needle is advanced through the soft tissue, including the iliopsoas muscle, through the anterior layer of the joint capsule, and into the anterior synovial space. Naturally, ultrasound-guided hip arthrocentesis is performed using strict sterile conditions. For a right-handed operator performing this procedure on the right hip, I recommend positioning oneself adjacent to the patient's right shoulder with the ultrasound machine adjacent to the patient's right foot. The operator can then place the probe over the right hip with the probe indicator pointed towards the umbilicus.
After the hip and synovial space have been brought into view sonographically, the needle can then be inserted from inferolateral to superomedial, that is, towards the umbilicus, in plane with the transducer. If you are a right-hand dominant operator performing arthrocentesis on the left hip, I recommend positioning oneself next to the patient's left knee and placing the ultrasound machine next to the patient's left shoulder. One can then place the probe over the left hip with the probe indicator pointed towards the patient's umbilicus. Once the hip and synovial space have been brought into view, the operator can aspirate with the needle in plane with the transducer, inserting the needle from inferolateral to superomedial. Let's consider how we might evaluate a limping child in the emergency department. A six-year-old male presents with leg pain and fever. He is non-weight-bearing on the right lower extremity and has pain with passive range of motion at the hip. A number of entities are in the differential diagnosis. Among them, non-skeletal causes such as appendicitis. The clinician may wish to obtain plain films to determine whether there's a fracture, neoplasm, slipped capital femoral epiphysis, or other entity that may be evident on x-ray. Once an ultrasound is performed showing an effusion in the anterior synovial space, we can narrow the differential diagnosis down to three likely causes. The differential diagnosis of a hip effusion is as follows. Septic arthritis, transient synovitis, and Lyme arthritis. Lyme disease can usually be distinguished from the other two entities based on clinical grounds. Lyme disease typically presents in an endemic area between April and October. Lyme arthritis tends to manifest as a polyarthropathy. If it does involve only one joint, it is usually the knee rather than the hip. If Lyme arthritis can be eliminated on clinical grounds, the remaining two entities are septic arthritis and transient synovitis. Septic arthritis is an orthopedic emergency that if left untreated can lead to osteonecrosis of the femoral head, osteomyelitis, systemic sepsis, and even death. It is more common in children than in adults and more common in boys than girls. Whereas adults who get septic arthritis tend to be ill or immunocompromised, Kids who get septic arthritis are usually previously healthy. The most common pathogen is Staph aureus, though you may see group B strep in neonates, Salmonella in patients with sickle cell, or Neisseria in sexually active teenagers. In contrast, transient synovitis is a benign inflammatory condition and is the most common cause of hip pain in kids. So our job is to distinguish between septic arthritis and transient synovitis. This is where the Coker criteria come into play. Coker and colleagues enumerated four criteria that point towards a diagnosis of septic arthritis. Fever, non-weight bearing status, white blood cell count greater than 12,000, and erythrocyte sed rate greater than 40. The more of these criteria present, the greater the likelihood of septic arthritis. This child is found to have an elevated white blood cell count and sed rate, giving him all four Coker criteria. An ultrasound guided arthrocentesis is performed, which reveals greater than 50,000 white blood cells in the synovial fluid, highly suggestive of septic arthritis. This patient requires urgent arthrotomy and joint irrigation by an orthopedist along with IV antibiotics. We've discussed the primary applications of hip sonography in the emergency department to identify an effusion and guide arthrocentesis. Other applications such as fracture identification may be feasible with sonography. This 10 year old male's left intertrochanteric hip fracture identified on x-ray was also evident 
on ultrasound. Notice the interrupted bony cortex of the femoral neck. A study by Safran and colleagues published in 2009 in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine suggested that sonography may have a role in detecting hip fractures that are not identified with plain radiography. Although this child's fracture was quite obvious, Marshburn and colleagues found in their 2004 study in the Journal of Trauma that sonography may be limited when it comes to identifying fractures at or above the intertrochanteric line. Thus, more study is needed before sonography can be recommended as a sensitive enough modality to detect hip fractures. In addition to its potential role in the setting of fractures, the use of sonography for hip dislocations and complications of prosthetic hips also needs further study. Other disorders, such as slipped capital femoral epiphysis, or SCIFI, and leg calvae perth disease, or osteonecrosis of the femoral head, may be amenable to sonographic evaluation as well. In summary, when performing hip sonography, remember to position the transducer parallel to the femoral neck with the probe indicator pointed towards the umbilicus. Remember the mantra that reminds you of the pertinent anatomy. Head with growth plate, neck iliopsoas, anterior synovial space. An effusion is present if it measures more than five millimeters across at the anterior synovial space or is more than two millimeters greater in width than the contralateral side. Finally, ultrasound guided arthrocentesis may be accomplished by using an in-plane approach with real-time needle visualization. This concludes this narrated PowerPoint presentation on hip sonography. Thank you for your attention.